Hi guys, this is Miss Howington at Research Triangle High School, and today we are talking about ocean currents. All right, so by the end of the video, plus the lessons that go with this, um, you should be able to explain why ocean currents flow. You should also be able to define an ocean current, um, and also use the surface currents to predict the movement of floating objects such as garbage. Okay, so, um, NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, defines a current as a continuous and directed movement of ocean water. These currents, um, so these moving, moving belts of ocean water uh, are both on the ocean surface um, and also going deep, deep down to the bottom of the ocean. They flow locally. Um, and also circulate water all across the world. They are a huge influencer of climate, um, which is one of the really important reasons that we care about them. So ocean currents are driven by four main things. Um, convection currents that are created due to differences in density. Um, because of differences in temperature and salt content. So uh, the global prevailing winds also impact the direction that ocean currents move. The Coriolis effect um, determines which way oceans, or helps determine which way oceans move, and also the shape of the ocean basins or the location of the land, because clearly ocean currents can't flow into a piece of land. Um, all right, so let's start out talking about convection currents or the thermohaline currents. So as uh, we know, warm water or warm fluids in general, um, the particles are more spread out because they're moving more. So we have a picture of the molecules in warm water here. Um, so we have fewer particles per volume of water. Um, in salt water, there, it, in warm salt water, there is less salt again because it's a little bit more spread out. Um, but also because of um, the dilution that occurs in warm water, and so this leads to warm water being less dense. Cold water particles are not moving very much, so they're very close together. Um, and there's, so there's more water molecules per unit of volume. And then also cold water has more salt in it because when ice freezes, it leaves behind the salt. Only the fresh water forms um, ice. And so you have a higher concentration of salt molecules in the water. So you have cold water, so the water particles are already close together, and then when the water is freezing into ice, it leaves behind all the extra salt. So you have really, really salty, really, really cold water. So there's lots and lots and lots of particles per unit area and so, or per unit volume. And so that water is super dense. Um, and so as we know, dense things sink. And so up at the North Pole and down at the South Pole, um, this happens. So the warm water comes in, it gets really cold. Um, forms ice, and so that water gets really, really cold and dense, and so it sinks down to about 2,000 meters, um, and it travels down south if we're at the North Pole, um, and so then more warm water comes in to take its place because it kind of left a void behind, um, and that whole process repeats. So this gives us the um, thermohaline currents. So thermo means temperature, uh, and haline means salt, so these currents are driven by the differences in density created by the differences in temperature and salt content. So the water, uh, scientists have tracked this very carefully and um, monitored it and so found out that the water only sinks at very specific locations. So it sinks off the coast of Greenland in the North Pole and then also off the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula and the South Pole. The Antarctic Peninsula is the part of Antarctica that sticks out the most. Um, 
And so once it sinks down, it travels very, very slowly. Um, the water can stay down at that 200 uh, or that 2000 meter level for hundreds of years to thousands of years. Um, so scientists have carbon dated the deep water of the ocean um, and that's they found it to be either hundreds of years to thousands of years old. And so this drives the global thermohaline circulation. So this drives the circulation of water all around the earth. So water sinks at off the coast of Greenland and becomes this is called a deep water formation, it travels down south all the way to Antarctica, it circles Antarctica, um, and then every once in a while it comes and resurfaces in the Pacific Ocean and um, in the Indian Ocean. So it's much harder to for scientists to track um, where exactly the cold water resurfaces and starts to warm again on the surface because this happens uh, much more diffusely. Um, so it's not as isolated as the deep water formations. All right, so ocean currents are also driven by prevailing winds. So if you guys remember from way back, um, we have our global prevailing winds that are driven also by convection currents. So we have warm air at the equator, rises, hits the top of the um, trop troposphere, and it cools and then sinks because it's more dense. And so that gives us these global um, wind belts. Um, and so you get friction between the wind and the ocean waters in like the first 10, 30 meters or so. Um, and so the surface water is drag, the surface winds are dragging the surface water along with it. So if we look here off the coast of Africa, our northeasterly trade winds are traveling, um, they're traveling to the west from the east. And then if we look at our uh, global current map, their currents are moving in the same direction. So off the coast of Africa, we have our currents moving from the west, or from the east to the west, sorry. Um, and so when we, so all of these things together um, create this global pattern of surface currents. So um, we have cold water sinking here and then warm water coming in to take its place. Again, cold water sinking here and warm water coming in to take its place from the equator. So um, we have warm water that warmed up because it was on the surface traveling along the Atlantic. So this in particular, we're going to look at the North Atlantic gyre. Um, and a gyre is just a large circulating pattern of water. And so the North Equatorial Current travels along the equator, gets warm because there's lots of solar insulation, um, and then it hits the North American continent, and so it's forced to curve upwards, and that's where we have the Gulf Stream that runs off of our coast in North Carolina, um, which travels up to the coast of Greenland, where it gets really, really cold and sinks, um, but some of that cold water continues to travel along the surface over to Europe, um, and it stays a little bit warmer. But it's traveling along the northern, the more northern latitudes, and so it gets cold. And as it travels towards the equator, it warms up again. And again, we end up with this gyre. So driven by the thermohaline currents because the cold water is sinking here. And so this Gulf Stream water is coming up here to take its place to fill in the void. Um, and we end up with currents that are very similar to that all over the world. There are five of them. There's one in the North Atlantic, one in the South Atlantic, one in the North Pacific, one in the South Pacific, and one in the um, Indian Ocean. But you do need to know the names of all the currents in the North Atlantic gyre. So if you look at these five ocean surface current gyres, um, you notice a lot of similarities. So along the um, western side of the gyre, you always have a warm water current coming from the equator. And on the eastern side of the gyre, you have a cold water current coming from the poles. Um, 
And so if we were to look at the climates of these areas that are next to the warm and cold water currents, we would also see a lot of similarities. Um, so areas that have warm water currents flowing next to them tend to have warm and uh, wetter climates. And then areas that have cold water currents flowing next to them tend to have drier, cooler climates. Um, so those are just some patterns that we can pick out uh, by comparing them all across the world. And then, of course, um, because of the Coriolis effect, all of the currents in the northern hemisphere will curve to the right of their point of origin, and all of the currents in the southern hemisphere will curve to the left of their point of origin um, because of the spinning of the Earth. All right. So hopefully that was a quick introduction to surface currents um, and ocean currents in general, and we will talk more about them in class.